sites and reading about all the like horrific um, incidents where women are just they have no value in, in so many countries. Um, it's, it's just as bad as it is here, but really it's a lot more permissive in all of these countries. And Stephanie Sinclair, who did this incredible body of work, <coughs> is here tonight. So I think it'd be really nice. Are you, where, did you, Stephanie, are you here? I'm here. Hey, come on up here. <coughs> don't, don't hide. Let's have you here because it's, it's a really exciting and an honor to be here with you. So, you know, this is, this is really powerful. Nobody, nobody ever understood anything about female circumcision or these, you know, the way children, poor girls are just sold off to these horrific men, you know. I mean, they can do anything they want with them, and you got in there. And, and you know, I'm sure it's it's been... Difficult, but also like really cool to be in there, right? And to be able to take pictures and show the world what's going on, and you know, you made a you made a big difference. You opened it wide open. You, you know, you really did. You opened it up. And the thing is, you know, I was sitting here watching this tonight, and it's like a long journey. But like, part of it is really, you know, like your work was really huge for me when I was like 20, 21, you know, and like watching, you know, I grew up in the 80s, you know, and so mm -hmm. this was a time when I was able to like, I was very influenced by, um, you know, and when I just started taking pictures, this what, you were right, this was the first time that domestic violence had been shown to the world. And um, all of this work was very, all of your work was incredibly influential. And, um, nice to be here and to see this and be part of the same movement yeah just in a different just in a different way mm -hmm. so it's just you know it's beautiful and it's beautiful it's something you know it's sad that it came from a tragic place um but it's really nice to see how things are changing and things are moving forward but it's you know you're just so <laughs> you're so insanely honest <laughs> i was just listening to her I was like oh my god i can't believe she says these so insanely no, no. honest, and you know, and, and sometimes to be quite honest, <coughs> as well, you know, we are starting, we're making Too Young to Wed into a nonprofit, mm -hmm. and this is um, because sometimes, like you, I feel I echo everything that you've said in the fact that you have to. It's so hard to just sit there and like oh, take yeah, that's pictures works. and like not be part of this change to, to in a more practical way, and so um, and so yeah, it was just. It's just really inspiring, and I feel proud to be part of this continuation and in a different way, and I hope that there's people in here that are going to be part of that, too, in their own ways, and I expect that that's going to be the case. <laughs> really beaten by her husband, um, like unrecognizably so. Mm -hmm. And um, so I come from a family with domestic violence as well. I'm not in my, my mother, but like definitely her sister. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, and you have, you know, it's, you have to be part of the change. And, and so just watching you, I was just like so impressed and so grateful for everything you've done. Thank you. And, um, and it's an honor to meet you. I never met her No, no, we all, we're always like sending emails and trying to hook up and like maybe like Italy or right. whatever. <laughs> you know, but we will, we will, we will. We're meant to be together, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But don't go away. Like, you know, this is the part of the night where you get to ask us anything you want. <laughs> ask her. Come on. Anything you want. Come on. Don't be afraid. Yes. What's your um, name? Kelly. Kelly. Okay. Were you ever afraid um, in the, the early pictures of uh, Lisa and uh, Garth? Garth? Yeah. Um, that he would hurt you? Like, turn around and... You know, I wasn't really thinking about it that much, and I think that's the way a lot of photographers are. When we're taking pictures, we're not thinking about what could happen to us. We sort of should. It's all so we have to catch it in the moment, and we're trying to figure out how to compose, and we're figuring out the light, we're figuring out what he might do next. And um, amazingly enough, you know, no man ever really like spun around and tried to to hurt me. Um, 
like they know who their targets are. And I think um, with the other uh, photographer, uh, Sarah Naomi Lepowitz, you know, when she was in that room and the, and the boyfriend was trying to beat his wife, his girlfriend, um, he, he had taken her cell phone earlier on, you know, in the evening. So she started to take pictures, but she knew that, you know, she saw that the people who were in the house weren't calling the police. So she had to get the police in the house. So she actually had the guts to go into his pocket and get that phone out. Now, when she did that, he didn't try to hit her or beat her. You know, most of these men, they'll, they might beat another man, but they will rarely focus on the woman because, uh, an outsider woman, because they see that their, you know, their, their desire is to, to control and, and terrorize and contain the woman that they're with. They see her as their property. We are not their property. We are, you know, we're free women. Right? I mean, we, they, they kind of know, I think they can see, I think abusers, they're really cowards. They're, they're sniveling little creeps. And so they are more afraid of someone who knows who they are. You know, they'll, they'll only attack the weaker ones. But if a man comes in and tries to do it, then they'll probably fight with him. And so sort of that, you know, the way that testosterone works. No, but but no, I I've never been in a situation. Were you ever like with all the men that you who had taken these young girls as their brides and and they knew why you were there to photograph? I mean, what did you tell them to get into their lives to take those pictures? Um, it's actually you know just listening to your process tonight. It was very similar to what my process is, mm -hmm. and it's funny because we've never spoken and I've never read that, but it was a very similar type of thing. It was about kind of. Believe, like really believing what you're doing and, yeah. and, and, and being so convinced yourself that when you have the conversation with them, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, you know, <laughs> they just kind of like let you do it. And you try, you have to phrase it correctly and you have to think quickly and stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's a very similar process actually. It's not, it wasn't, it's not so different. Mm -hmm. It's just about, um, I mean, but yeah, I've had, you know, like you as well, I've had some people be very upset with me <laughs> afterwards. But not, not, not so much because they didn't allow me to do it in the first place, but because, you know, sometimes there's, you know, as in the same with you, when you had people say yes and then it kind of goes out and then they're like, wait a minute, like yeah. I didn't quite understand that was coming. Mm -hmm. And um, I've only actually had one person that I know of be very upset with me. Um, but, you know, he's not a, 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 he's a very dangerous man. So, you know, it's one of those things. But it's... Um, Surprising that there are more. Well, you know, I'm probably, I've, you know, I've had to be very careful with um, how I presented the work and I've talked about it and kind of let the pictures do more talking than than you talk, you, than the language even that you use mm -hmm. is different than the language that I use, and I think that's because I'm. This is more of a cultural issue mm -hmm. than it is something that's so clear cut. You know, this you're documenting in a, in a much more diff difficult way, I think, documenting something that's very taboo in American society. And so the people are kind of like, yeah, this is definitely wrong. Whereas it, with the stuff that I'm doing is people are not quite sure. They they know it's wrong because everyone always says, I'll be like, how old is she? She's like 22. She's like 10. You know, so you would definitely always know that there was, like there was, they knew, they knew this was wrong. But at the same time, they didn't, it, it took time. I mean, of course, they would eventually tell me how old she was and stuff, but it took time. And, and so because of that, I and because I have so many translators and stuff involved mm -hmm. and people that can have, and the girls themselves can have repercussions, I've had to be very careful with the presentation of the work, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, it's just different. It's a little bit, you know. Have you ever thought of taking these powerful pictures and, um, uh, putting together like a poster campaign that would go around to these communities that would be seen um, like on the street corners or sides of buildings and I mean, you know, like I said, we're just now starting to turn turn the campaign into a nonprofit. So mm -hmm. at this time, um, we're doing right now we're kind of doing high level policy work. So we're have these ex this is a kind of a smaller version of a 
large scale exhibition where all the pictures are as big as these big ones, and there it's with, it's in Geneva at the United Nations right now. And um, but I do think at some point we want to do more grass grassroots level, it's, and and we will for sure. Stuff. But that's what matters really, because these are the people that need. They're not, that's why I'm not really all for the NGOs and the UN and all that stuff because they're all about raising money for themselves to do these reports and these studies. They're not really about stopping this kind of stuff from happening because yeah. to do that, you've got to get this information that's in your pictures directly in front of the women and, and the young girls. You've got to set the fire in their bellies. And, and that will happen. I think it's just... There, there are there are a couple different levels on that. One is, you know, we it's a, it, this is illegal. Mm -hmm. This is there's no question that in most countries, almost every country that's in this exhibit, it's illegal. So the idea of the policy, it's pushing for the laws to be enforced. The laws mm -hmm. are there; they just need to be enforced. So that's one element of it. But um, the other element for me is um, before doing a poster campaign, which is difficult and is something that is we're thinking about doing maybe maybe not a poster campaign maybe it's um something that happens in schools i'm not sure we have to we're just schools, exploring yeah. that now but right now we're all, we're working on building girl groups which is what you were talking about mm -hmm. like when women get together that these empowerment moments are in the shelters well that's what we're working on right now is trying to facilitate some of these girls to get together mm -hmm. to have these conversations and so that's more of the priority at, at this moment. Because we're just like, we're been in, like really have, we just incorporated last week. <laughs> so we're just getting there. And so, you know, and we just transitioned from kind of, instead of being stuck as an individual to help, mm -hmm. trying to, and, and just working on a kind of an advocacy policy level way to making sure that this work, and some of it is just also livelihood. I mean, it's like giving them value through economics. Mm -hmm. And that's also something that even that I saw in my family. If a, if a woman could have, could bring in money, then, or were more educated, then they had more value. They weren't just positioned. I guess. I would look at somebody like Rihanna. Well, yeah. yeah. And that, I'm not talking There's about... There's so that. many rich women out there who have, you know, the money, they have the access, they can do whatever they want, and they still <laughs> keep you know, like bending over and letting these men get away with making them, humiliating them, abusing them. I mean, I, but I think, I think marriage, economic it is, but it's part it's of it. It's different. It's, child marriage is a little bit different issue. Domestic violence is, I mean, it's definitely violence against, against women, don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. But this, this is because it's children, then it's violence against children. And so the women aren't, they're not, these girls aren't given an opportunity to say to to do much you know they're overpowered by their families by yeah. their husband it's not just their husbands it's everybody it's everybody yeah so it's a different so that's why economic empowerment gives them a regular an actual value that's beyond them be, they can't say no they can they do but then what happens to them after that they're ostracized they're different things happen so it's not about just because they're children. So that's what makes it different from what you're doing. What we're, you know, there's definitely an element that's very, very similar, mm -hmm. but they're not grown women. They're so, not even allowed to go to school, right? Yeah, so that's where the, that's where the difference is, I think. And, and so that's why, of course, you know, d domestic violence with adult women, they just women at least, then they, you know, they, they at least are adults. And so they, and that's where economic empowerment, all that stuff is, is not the only issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's not a question, but like a statement, I guess. Sure. I think the conversation needs to be more on the man not to do it, to maintain his anger. Because <laughs> it's not like, I don't know how to say it, but like, you can tell a girl, like, okay, a man shouldn't hit you. But you shouldn't tell a man you don't hit a woman. Don't rape a little girl. If you're 25, don't touch someone who's five. Like, I think it needs to be like, yeah, but you know, towards there. We do have those messages coming across very clearly. You know that men should not, boys should not be doing this to girls. I mean, I don't, maybe on a, on a football team, they may be told they can do whatever they want. But generally in the society, they, guys are getting that message. That's why so many men are changing. I mean, 
I know that the battered women's movement doesn't want to hear me say this, but I will keep saying it, that women have to be leaders. We have to be leaders. If we lead properly and men know that we're serious, they won't try to get away with a lot of stuff that they do get away with, which is number one, you know, physical abuse. And so I, I think, you know, if, if, we, if we train girls to be leaders and not to accept things to become unbeatable, the guys will follow. They're not going to be with a girl unless they learn that they can't beat her. I mean, they're not going to... They're not going to be with the, the girls aren't going to let them into their lives unless they are behaving in, the, in a good way towards them with respect. So I think that, you know, we can keep, we've been saying this, that we have to put the emphasis on men for 30 years. And it hasn't changed, you know. We keep saying, you know, let's not talk about the girls and the women, let's just talk about the men. And I'm saying we've been doing that for many years, and it hasn't worked. So now we have to start saying, come on, girls. Think of yourself in a much more respected, strong way. And when you're in trouble, look for people to help you to get out of that situation. Look for the right adults. Look for the teachers. Look for the shelters. You know, a lot of women know those shelters are out there, and they won't go to them. Especially if they have money. They won't go to them. So as long as we just keep saying we have to teach the guys not to do this, nothing is really going to change. Because, and especially we slip back during the... 21st century, with all the wars that we were being put into, where violence and men being able to do whatever they wanted to do was glorified, encouraged, they were paid to be like this. You know, it's, I don't know, like, you know, I used to, I used to live with Philip Jones Griffiths, who was a great war photographer and magnum. And whenever there was like a magnum photographer who would um, be supporting a kind of photographer that that Philip thought was really bad. Um, and there are a lot of photographers in Magnet that Philip thought were really, really bad because they were just way too commercial, way too much about art, um, no substance. And so I remember Philip, and if you go on my um, Vimeo account, um, you'll see a, a video that I did about Philip after he died. Um, and so I'm not telling you a secret, you know, that out of school. Um, what Philip said to Alex Webb in Magnum, who was supporting one of these photographers, I think it was Alex Soth, who he didn't really like at all, he said, he went to Alex's wife, and he said, don't have sex anymore with Alex until he stops supporting these kinds of photographers. <laughs> because he, he knew that, like, that's our, that's our currency, you know? Well, sex is our power. So if we don't, if we're not nice to you guys anymore, then you're going to just keep getting away with whatever you want to get away with. We have to be strong. We have to be. We've been saying that for 30 years now, that men have to stop being violent. And, and most men know that. Men have changed a lot in the last, especially in the last 15 years. There are a lot of programs for men that are working, where men you know, go into these programs for three to five years. They're changing their behavior. They're stopping. And a lot of the women don't stop when they get back with the men because they're so addicted to that, to that going back and forth, you know, the violence, the jealousy, <coughs> the abuse, the making up. I mean, we, we just can't keep saying those like pat social um, slogans anymore, you know? It's like women have to change too. On both parts, I do agree, but I think like if you start from young, if you teach your son, like the baby, like in these pictures, um, from too young to red, you always, I, I love that you have like the younger generations, even though these girls are like 12, like you have like maybe a three-year-old there, and it's like, okay, so is it going to repeat itself, or like should we start with the younger men, the younger male child? Hey, don't hit your wife, don't hit your little sister, like that's not allowed. It's on both parts, in my opinion. I do agree, but I feel like if we start from young with the men, the boys, then mm -hmm. that message will change. And I also think totally it's, agree. it's a shaming aspect of it probably makes these women come back. Mm -hmm. Like, like not saying anything or ask for help because it's embarrassing. In a sense, it is embarrassing. And then I feel like there's this obligation to your community not to say anything. Like, okay, you just suffer in silence. So I, I'm not a victim of this or survivor whatsoever, but like, I, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you're right, 
and sometimes it works that way. But for, you know, some women, they will sacrifice their children. They know that their children are being sexually abused by these guys, and they want to have that man in their life. So they look the other way. So we can't keep calling women <coughs> victims, really. I mean, it's not cool to be a victim. It's cool to be a survivor and to get out, whatever it takes. To be a victim and just let it go on for many years and let your children get sucked down the drain like that, that to me is uh, criminal. That's not why we're supposed to be able to raise, to give birth and bring children into the world. I mean, this is supposed to be the land of the free and the brave and all that stuff. So, and that's for every man and woman. Yes. what Unbeatable is all about. That's what I started this campaign for. And I've had a lot of the battered women's, I, you know, I had a kick, uh, not a Kickstarter, uh, Indiegogo campaign. And I really thought that all of these shelters that I had raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for through the last 15 years would step up to the plate. And I made phone calls to them and said, you know, whatever you can get women to do. I was giving my blood away, you know, and say, come on, you know, uh, for 20 bucks, you'll get my blood. They, they didn't want to do it because they don't want to say that women really have to get out of these relationships. They don't want to say it. It is so much bad politics to talk like the way I'm talking. So my way is to get with young girls and hopefully get them to see what's going to happen. You know, you stay with this guy, you'll end up like Sarah. Or you're with the guy, you think he's on your side, you're going to have a baby with him, you're 14 years old, and now he's raping you every day, and, you know, he can examine you when he comes home from work and, like, tell whether you've had sex with somebody else and beat you up, and you think it's so nice in the beginning, you know, just listen to your mother and father, listen to your teachers, listen to society. That's what I'm saying is listen to all of us who are saying, no, you cannot be with an abuser. You have to get out of that relationship as fast as you can and use whatever is available to you in our society to do it, whatever. My biggest problem is with the courts because the courts will always abandon like the safety of women and children and side with the men. Nine times out of ten. That's why so many women are truly desperate. And, but you know what? Whatever it takes to get your, yourself and your kids out of that situation and I always tell the women, don't even trust the courts. The courts are not going to do the right thing. I don't trust judges. When I, when I got that gender fairness award from the Supreme Court judges, there was like a whole court filled with these guys. And I said to them, you guys are the problem. You are the ones who are making all the problems for women. You don't understand how psychotic these men are, how dangerous they are, and you keep giving them you know, too many chances. You don't make it, you don't make it hard for them. They should... They should be humiliated in public. They should go to prison. They should pay really high fines. They need to suffer consequences. So, I mean, I, I think that we have to, we, we just have to start putting the stories out in a very open, honest, clear way. The message has to be clear that women have the power. And also, I'm curious to know, when you, you've obviously like, lived with these families who follow some of them for quite some length of time, and wondering also, like, what, I guess, what the percentages of the children that kind of grew up in these environments do you see kind of perpetuating this pattern? It's really high. It's really, really high. It's like 65%. <coughs> yeah. I'm going to get her out of here. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm okay. so sorry. I have no commitment. Otherwise, I would stay all night. <laughs> Thank you for listening to everything she says. <laughs>
was, I think, a senior in high school, um, and the, the twins were maybe 14 or so, it sort of came out that, um, and by, by just chance, I guess, the girls were, were all rebelling against their mother, mm -hmm. and she happened to pick up a phone call one day when one of the girls was on the phone with her father, and a very sexually explicit conversation was happening where it was like, well, you know, I know you're pissed at mom, but dad's going to come home and make it all better and blah, 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 blah. And what ended up happening was that um, the mom, you know, caught this conversation, flipped out, called the cops. They were there when the father came home. He was arrested. Um, luckily, the judge in the court system was, was on the side of the, the mother and the girls, and he was spending, I believe, his life in prison. Wow, great. Um, Right. But the uh, the outcome of it, I mean, the immediate outcome was great because then they stopped being sexually assaulted by their father. Um, but in the long term, you know, a couple of them, I believe, had kids in high school. Um, they, you know, end up in these really dysfunctional relationships that continue to perpetuate. And another pretty horrible side effect is that um, being that uh, their mother really had this knee-jerk reaction to immediately involve the police, and then it became news all over the entire county. Mm -hmm. Like, then everyone in school knew, you know, every, everyone in their lives for, you know, from that point on pretty much knew exactly what was going on, and there was a huge stigma behind the fact that, you know, these girls had been abused by their father. And it's just something that, you know, I kind of wonder about, you know, if, if we as a society didn't view this as like, oh, well, you know, your dad did this to you, you know, rather rather than ostracizing someone to take them in and say, look, you know, we, we get that this thing that happened to you was horrible and we're going to give you support in the fact that you're walking away from it. I think that too often doesn't happen. And, um, you know, I mean, it, to me, it's, it's pretty terrifying and that's why I asked the questions I asked. So... Sorry, sidebar, really long story. Yeah, no, but, uh, no, yeah. it's, um, the children who come out of these families, they, they have to get the right support, absolutely, but a lot of times they don't, and they have to find that in themselves, you know, whether they do it through their faith, um, or through connections with, you know, other family members or friends, that's why unbeatable is so important because this covers everything incest you know violence all kinds of sexual assault and the more the kids start really talking about it instead of glorifying abuse and violence and and those you know ways of relationships where somebody controls you through intimidation and you know, if we just start being a lot more open and honest about it, then we will be educating future generations to be more supportive of the ones who do get, who get the, you know, the, they're, they're, they're born into horrible situations. They don't really have a chance to get out unless they emancipate themselves. Um, or, you know, just say, this is what's going on. I mean, it's, the best way is to speak out and be honest, and maybe you won't get a lot of support, but I think there, especially through the internet, there's so many kids who are talking about this stuff, and they talk with each other, and they have chat rooms, and so it's not like there's so much alone like they always used to be. Things are getting a lot better now, and I think a lot of it has to do with social media, like mm -hmm. Facebook, and chat rooms the chat rooms where they can talk about abuse. I mean, I think it's very powerful that you are essentially celebrating victory over, you know, as someone who leaves a situation like that is celebrated, and I think that's really what needs to happen overall and not be something that's such a fight to, to see that happen, and I really, mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Do you want to ask a question? Do we already yeah, actually, yeah, you talked a lot about it, but I was just going to ask, you know, being, you know, someone that's, you know, been around for, you know, remembering so much myself. So when you're talking about the 80s, and things like that, how, what do you feel personally, the kind of, how it's evolved, the feminist kind of movement now, and what kind of messages women are receiving, you know, um, as, you know, dealing with these kind of um, domestic violence issues? It really feels like we're slipping backwards. Um, uh, I, I, I'm pretty appalled at the, uh, the rhetoric that comes out of the Republican Party and out of so many men and women 
who support <coughs> men to be like this. Um, uh, I, I really think that in this country, it's, it's almost like they just don't get it, what a woman's life is all about. They don't get the importance of women having total autonomy over their bodies, you know? Um, so I think we have to just keep doing campaigns and speaking out and being really bold. We have to be bold. We can't be modest little good girls. Um, and that's what those kinds of men are so afraid of. They're afraid of, of our strength and our courage. And so they, they are constantly trying to intimidate us and call us terrible names and say we're sluts because we want to be on the birth control pills and, you know, and we need to control our libidos and all that bullshit. Um, I mean, really, they didn't used to talk like that back in the 70s. Um, and I would like to take us back to the 70s. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I think it's really gotten much worse. I think it's so much more repressive now. And there's such a culture of fear and oppression on women right now. Um, I don't really see a lot of the, the um, women's movement these days being as bold as they used to be. I think they're, they're, it's the, the, the language is a lot more safe. And it's sort of like the cliches we've always heard. And that, that doesn't work, especially with the youth. They, you know, they don't buy into that. They want to hear the truth. Yes? I was just wondering about your conversation with Hillary that you were really shocked by. It seems like you've come around to her point of view. I mean, are there <coughs> completely, not completely? Is it just a more, I don't know, thinking about things more deeply, I'm just wondering at this point where you might differ from. Well, I think that I came around to it because it was like 20 years later and I saw that we had done so much work with educating society and really, I mean, a lot more women have, have left and have gotten those divorces and are raising their kids on their own and they're much happier and they're raising kids to be really help, ha happy, you know, to feel good about themselves. So. I think that, you know, women have been changing their lives, and I, I just really feel now it's, it's, there's more of a chance to say to women, you've got a responsibility here. You're not just a victim. You're not your husband's, you know, his tool. You know, you can speak up, and you can, and if you feel like you can't, then you have to get into a safe place and be around people who will protect you and your kids. That's why... I mean, and also I saw how, how Hillary was so, she got a big lesson mm -hmm. when she was in the White House. I mean, she was made a, a real fool out of um, by her husband. And, and uh, I think she learned a lot, too. She learned a lot of humility. Um, I mean, I was upset with Hillary for actually said, always blaming the women that he was sleeping with. You know, and saying, oh, these women, they're just trying to drag him down. Why wasn't she saying, like publicly, my husband is a dog. I've never been able to trust him, you know, when it comes to being with other women. No, I didn't feel she was honest. So I had a, I've been having a lot of uh, psychological tussles with Hillary in my head. Um, but the one thing I think that she had right back then was that not all the responsibility. We all have to take responsibility for the violence in our lives, in society, in our families. We all have to take responsibility. But by putting it all on the men, nothing is going to change. And by blaming women, nothing is going to change. I'm not saying that we should be blaming women, you know, whether they're sleeping with our husbands or if they're beating us up. You know, we got to get out of that relationship. You know, she would have done a lot if she... If she'd taken a break from him, she would have done a lot. She, 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 you know, a lot of these politician wives, they don't stand up for themselves like they ought to be. Um, they don't set good examples for the rest of women and girls in the country. I don't care how powerful they are. You know, what you are like in your own home, that's what comes first. Do you want to send a question over there? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Um, I think a big part of the message is, that's not being heard is um, that we get into relationships often and that validates ourselves. And so, like, if you, like, I've been in a situation where I was with someone and I was infatuated with them, and then at one point he was violent with me, and I knew if I retaliated, it would have escalated, so I calmed down. And when I left, I cried and I felt like I like this person, like you feel in your heart, mm -hmm. but you also see what they are, like what they could be. And the moment, the time we hung out after that, it was completely different. And, you know, I tried to be myself, and he wanted to dominate me. I, I felt it, I could see it, and I vowed to not, not hang out with him again. And I think that if I didn't value myself, mm -hmm. I would have given in to that infatuation and he would have validated me, I would have felt pretty with him. And he was a very broken person and he wasn't doing well and he would have found power in his dominance over me. Mm -hmm. So I was able to recognize it and I think a big piece of it is like being able to know who you are, value yourself and not be able to, like not take anything from you, anybody. You just like nailed it right there. That's, all, that's what it's all about, is that we do ourselves. And a lot of times we don't grow in, up in homes where we're being valued. I'm, I wasn't valued in my home. I was always told I was stupid, I was lazy, I was going to be a homeless woman, you know, I mean, all of that stuff. But for some reason, I had this sense that, no, you know, I know what I'm going to do with my life and I value myself. Maybe some girls are not born that way or maybe the abuse, the psychological abuse, especially if there's any kind of sexual abuse going on, I didn't have that to grow up with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, really hard for girls or boys who are growing up in these homes. I don't, you probably didn't have sexual abuse growing up, right? That's a whole other terrible dimension. Um, but for the, for the children who haven't had that and who value themselves, that's the key right there. So if you value yourself, why in the world are you gonna let somebody do this kind of thing. Like Hedda Nussbaum, that woman who I told you he, her, her husband beat the child to death, and he, mean, he raped her, he beat her with a metal pipe all the time, whatever. She was never beaten in her home. Mm -hmm. Her parents were very kind and loving. She was supported. She went to college. She was a book editor. So what I'm trying to figure out is not what happens for women like you and me, but what happens with women who haven't had any of this abuse, and they still let a guy take complete control over them and just treat them like they are a worthless piece of garbage and do that to the children too. I mean, you know, we can say all we want and that the men have to change, but if a woman like Hedda Nussbaum doesn't learn what she has to do to change, we don't have much of a chance. No, I think it's the conflicting moment where it's just like it hurts, but you love them. Yeah. And you just don't know. Like I felt it and I saw... I could see how, if I continued, I would have went down that path. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, a year later, you wouldn't even know who you are anymore. You would be that woman that he was trying to make you into. Like, the, the strange thing is that so many of the women who end up battered um, were really vivacious, strong girls who, you know, are like leaders, you know, in sports and, you know, really were doing very good in school and were popular and funny and very sociable, but the guys that they get involved with mm -hmm. are the kind of quiet ones who have a lot of problems, they, you know, they feel like loners, they need a girl like that who will help them adapt to society, but the more they give their power to that kind of a guy, the more they go down, they don't help him to go up because he's just going to squeeze them until there's no more life, until he's, she's not the girl that he first said he was in love with. He's just going to beat her down, call her every name in the book, make her feel like she's worthless and everything is her fault. So you can't think straight anymore. So, but I'm not going to say this. I'm going to leave all these unbeatable girls to tell the truth about what's going on. They can tell it better than any of us can. Um, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add because I, I, I think what you know, I always said was true. When, 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 I mean, I grew up in here in the Bronx with a single mother in Puerto Rican, and I think that we know from Latin American countries, which is what I only Americans before, is that we're taught from an early age, we're taught from an early age that 
the boy is the one that's supposed to be in charge. Yeah. For one. Um, and the girl always in the household is treated a little different. The girls can't do something while the guys, you know, the girls have to be home by six while we can stay up to ten. You know, those kind of things. And I remember distinctly growing up and in my early relationships in my late teens and college years where I sort of started acting that way. You know, in terms of where my girl, I thought my, where my girlfriend said was going somewhere and where I would start kind of challenging it to some degree. Fortunately for me, it was girls that were leading to, to professional lives, so they weren't having it. Mm -hmm. And it helped me see that mm -hmm. and kind of change that very quickly because, I mean, it was like, you're going where with the girls? No, you can't. Uh, uh, hello? Uh, you know, because was, that was, I, mean, I was losing relationships, so I learned very early on and quickly, so it never escalated to that. But I guess my point is, what do you think in society can, can be done to kind of change that to the guy who's in charge and what we're told from an early age that that's the thing in a different way that kind of gets that across? earlier on? I mean, because I've heard that in the room a little bit, but I can kind of see how... Yeah, but you, you got it. I mean, but this is what we're saying. Like, girls are the leaders. And if you're, you know, if you're involved with girls who, who know their value, know their worth, then they're not going to let you get away with that. And eventually, you're going to stop pulling that on every girl that you go out with, cross-examining her when she's not with you. That's how it is going to have to go, and we can't keep slipping back. You know, we have to keep moving forward, and females have to be really vigilant about this stuff, and they can't romanticize about it. You know, like a lot of times, I hear girls say they don't want to be with a guy who's too nice and too respectful and too kind. You know, they want that guy who's kind of dominant and a bit of a bully, and he knows where he's going, and he's. Oh, he's so jealous of you. He doesn't want you talking to anybody else. A lot of girls think that that's really sexy in the beginning. Wow, he really loves me. I mean, that's what one woman in a shelter told me a long time ago, that in the Puerto Rican culture, that's what it means. When he's jealous and he beats you and he says he doesn't want you with any other man, oh, that means he really loves you. Okay, we have to like, be very clear about how this is brainwashing. And we all have to change, but it seems like it's changed, you know, in your generation. I mean, you you changed. So I would say that I want to talk with more young males. Um, this is not just about females that I'm going to be interviewing and spending time with. It's about males, too, who are making the changes. And I know that a lot of young males are in very abusive relationships where their girlfriends are extremely jealous and controlling and violent. And, and, I, and then the guys will come up to me and say, what am I supposed to do? You know, my girlfriend hits me all the time. And I tell them, don't go down to her level. She is really bad for you. She's going to get you into so much trouble. Get away from her as fast as you can. Just like, don't buy into it. And so we have to see that we can all, we can all be victims of this. We can all be targets of all kinds of abuse. And we got to take the blinders off because none of it has anything to do with love. It's all, as you were saying a while ago, it's all like that person's insecurity. So, you know, don't waste your time with people like that, really. Can we take one more question and then I think people will stay and talk to you sort of in groups if that's okay? Okay. Are you sure. okay with that? Sure, sure, sure. Right. What I wanted to say to you though is because I really want your Kickstarter campaign to, I want to help it, you know, and I think it's really, really important because of events, so many events that you do here that really make a difference. So what I wanted to say is that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to donate three Living with the Enemies from the original printing. And with them, I'm going to give um, an unbeatable t-shirt. OK? So you know you can just decide what you want to ask for them and put it out there. But Thank you. Yeah. say that before we even open the doors here, when we were literally trying to raise the money to open the doors, mm -hmm. and um, 
we were like, oh man, if we could just get, you know, $5,000, we could actually get the doors open. And we had an auction downtown, and Donna was, she bid up this print. Not, and she didn't even try to get it for herself. She just drove the bidding higher and higher. Yeah. I mean, I was really, was there. I was really, I was really pissed off when I saw all these photographers were in the room and they were all bidding like 200 bucks, 300 bucks. I know how valuable all these pictures are and big prints and so, so I just went crazy. I yeah. We got a thousand or <laughs> Yeah, that was a huge, that was a huge push for us. Thank you. Yeah. And this place going. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know that. That's cool. That's cool. That's very cool. I have yeah. a, a question about what you're. Um, I have two questions. One is um, what you're going to do going forward about this project, and secondly, um, I'm on the board of a, of a nonprofit that helps children, uh, girls in India, mm -hmm. um, have vocational skills so that they don't have to go and get married and and um, they can learn, and there's a center that they go to where they, um, where they can go and learn English and learn computer skills and so forth. Right. I was wondering if there's something like that the equivalent here in the U.S. that you are familiar with that helps young girls go after school and they can be together and... Um, I don't know, honestly, I'm not sure. I haven't checked out, um, but I, I don't think it should be very hard to just, you know, get on the internet and you just, mm -hmm. Because I think that Put would be all a good the right place keywords to go and if, it's not, if it's not happening at home, mm -hmm. it's ha it, there could be a place outside of the home where like I'm an sure after school, yeah. you know, where there's other female um, mentors that might allow these girls to have sort of a... a well, that is the idea of Unbeatable, too, is to have, and I've also been photographing older women who got into abusive relationships when they were younger, like women in their... 50s and 60s, and they're telling their stories so that I want to establish like a mentorship program with this um, movement so that the older women can really make it very clear to the young girls what, what they're going to experience if they stay in these abusive relationships. Um, you know, really, I would tell you to just make it really clear with these girls that are in the program that it's not just about computer skills and learning how to speak, you know, languages. And what, it's really like how to recognize signs of abuse. And so you, you have to incorporate that into your well, in, program. In, in, in this situation, it's not abuse, it's just getting married off early and having children and never having... Oh, come on, getting married early, mm -hmm. there's so much abuse that goes on. A woman has no, a girl has no power in these relationships. Mm -hmm. You gotta talk about sexual violence. Mm -hmm. You have to talk about sex. Mm -hmm. Like, when I, you know, started working with batters programs, and um, I would live with the men in the program. So I'd, I'd say, you go back and you ask your wife if I can come home and live with you, because I want to see what's going on. It's not enough for me just to see what's happening in the program. I want to know what's happening at home. And um, so then one of the, the leaders in the program said that the hardest thing that they have to do is to get the men to talk about the sexual abuse that they commit. I mean, they, they don't mind doing any of these like unbelievably hideous things, you know, at home with their, with their wives or their kids. They don't want to talk about it. We have to force people to talk. You have to force them. You can't be nice about it. You can't be, there's no politically correct way to go about this. You have to put all these stories out there in a very clear way. So, you know, any young girl, 12, 13, 14, who's being married off, she has no power. That guy can do anything he wants to her. Yes. Yeah? Um, did you ever find like a woman who was abused, like married but not having children? Yeah. Like they were not under plans? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was thinking a little bit, um, like I'm Peruvian and when I very first got here it really impressed me like, you know, everything that happens like, yeah sure, I mean it's a poor country, you know, and I think this schema like repeats in a lot of places. Uh, but I was actually thinking in the role that women have in society and they have something that 
women do not because we don't have like the power to have children, kids. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was thinking a little bit um, what do you think is the relationship of society thinking in women before even individuals, more like potential mothers. Do you know what I mean? That's a good idea, absolutely. I mean, when I was growing up, home ec was really a big thing, and we were taught how to sew and how to take care of ourselves and how to um, type and all that sort of stuff. But absolutely, there should be... I mean, I, I'm a firm um, proponent of uh, child... Uh, sex education in, in lo you know, like seventh grade, earlier the better. Just give them a lot of information, talk about it, demystify it as much as possible. The more information we give to our little ones about sex, you know, it's, it's for sure that they're not going to want it until they're really ready for it, mm -hmm. you know. It's like, that's the way it works. Um, so I would just say, Education is key. Um, educating girls and educating the boys, absolutely. Um, some of my friends, they have these young sons um, who are in their early teens, and they're really scared. They don't, they don't want to get any girls pregnant if they're having sex. They're like saying to their mothers, please go out and buy some condoms for me because I don't want to get these girls pregnant. I mean, they know what's going to happen. It's going to be horrible. So, talk about it. And did you find any difference between um, how they ended like the relationships between the women that actually had kids and the ones who did not? Did I find any difference um, patterns of how they actually um, stopped being abusive? You know, I am not. Look, I'm not, first of all, I'm not like a, a researcher like that. I, I don't have any, I don't have that kind of funds that all of these big organizations have. Um, so, and that's not my job to go out and find those statistics and all that. I'm a photographer. I'm a photographer. So, in what I see, um, I don't see any real difference a lot of times between women who don't have children and then women who do, if they're under the, the you know, spell of a man who's really determined to turn them into their, basically their slave, their sex slave, their house slave, you know, they don't have any rights anymore, then, you know, eventually they'll have kids, and eventually their kids will be tortured, and, but in the early days they're being tortured before they have kids. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I mean, I that the earlier part about educating children and letting them know, you know, the future. And we talk about bodies and we talk about specific parts of bodies and, and that it's a precious thing and that no one should touch you in places you feel uncomfortable. But starting that conversation younger, letting them know that they're, they're like agents of their bodies and that it's important. So yeah, that's families so may have their own discipline and ways of doing things, but it's important for the individual, the child, to know that that is their body and they they are responsible and mm -hmm. they can take care of it. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, look at I don't if you any of you want to be my Facebook friend and <laughs> you know go on my page. I've got a little story on there right now about this uh, priest. Um, I don't know, maybe Uganda or something where they're actually telling the females that they have to go into church without their undergarments on. And that's the only way that they, God can really come into them. So, you know, absolutely. For young kids to be hearing that their bodies are precious and nobody has the right to touch them or feel them, I mean, we read about it in the paper all the time. There was a story in the paper today. I have it in, I, I read the post every day. And um, there was a story in there about this girl who kept telling her teachers that these boys were touching her, were, you know, throwing their bodies against her, were throwing her down on the ground and humping her. And she tried to get help, and nobody took it seriously. <coughs> nobody. All of those, all those teachers should, I think they should go to jail. I think they should be in prison. You know, we have to make examples of adults who are in authority 
who let these abuses continue. Um, and, and then that puts more power into the girl because she was trying to get help for so long and, and, and it was happening right under their noses. It happens all around us, all the time. If you read the paper, not just the Post, but read the New York Times. You know, they don't, New York Times will publish these stories, but they don't give it as much play as the Post does. <coughs> but that's so good, you know, to tell your children in schools, out of schools, your bodies are really precious. You are precious. You don't let anybody pull you down or do whatever they want to do with you. It's, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I really grew up without sexual abuse. I'm, and so I feel really thankful and very fortunate that nobody was, you know, nobody really interfered with my process of growing up as a free and open-minded female. Fearless female. But it's still. <laughs> Stick around if you want, um, and you can stay and just relax and talk as much as you want. And we'll probably go off for food in a little bit. And you're welcome to join us if you want for a favorite next week. Thank you.